Good day, my name is Tian Hildenhuis and in this video I would like to discuss a very important subject with you but one that also causes quite a lot of confusion among Christians, namely the laws of God. Regarding which of God's laws are still applicable to us to this day? Are all of them still applicable? Are some applicable? Are we not under the law? Can we chuck away the whole book? We will see what the Bible says today. And we must read the word as it is written, as I always say. But my dear brother and sister, it's always about our Lord Jesus Christ. So let us pray together. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we thank you this day. Thank you, Lord. We know the Bible says where two or three are gathered in my name, I am in their midst. So, Lord, we know you're here. We were busy with this production, but you will also be there. We people will be watching this video wherever they may be. And we pray that you alone will be glorified. We pray that your Holy Spirit will take me out of the way, that I will not be the one speaking, Lord, but that your Holy Spirit will speak in and through me, and that all our hearts will be willing to receive the truth of the Word of God. And thank you, Father, that you give us the authority to say to Satan, we bind your works now. You will not steal this message from the ears of the people of God, and you will leave in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. I pray against the spirit of religion. I pray against the spirit of judgment and criticism. I pray against the spirit of Jezebel in this moment. And I say you will leave and you will not stop the ears of the children of God to receive this message in Jesus' name. Lord Jesus, now we pray that you will cover us with your blood, please. We pray that you will set up your angels all around us and that you yourself will be a wall of fire around about us so that every place where we're busy with this video will be a safe place and that we can know you are with us. Thank you, Lord, for your presence. Please take us by the hand and lead us by your Holy Spirit now. We ask it in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, all of you know me. Now, I always start with this verse in 2 Corinthians 1 verse 13 that reads, For we write none other things unto you than what ye read or acknowledge. And I trust ye shall acknowledge even to the end. And so today we must also read what we can understand from the Bible regarding God's different laws. Because Jesus said in Matthew 22 verse 29, Ye do err, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. And that is our problem. We do not know the power of God. Why? Because we do not know the scriptures of God. Why? Because we do not know the author of the scriptures. For so many years we were all so busy with dead religion. And hear me today, religion is dead relationship with Jesus Christ is life. So we were so busy with dead religion, we did not enter into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And I tell you today, if you have not yet received the Lord Jesus in your life, at the end of this video, there will be a prayer that you can pray from your heart to receive the Lord Jesus in your life as well, so that you can ensure that you will be with him in all eternity. But until we get there, we need to learn what the word of God teaches us, how we should live according to the word of God, because it is all about him. He leads us through his Holy Spirit, but we must be willing to listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit, to be led by the Holy Spirit, according to the word of God. I'm going to show you a number of slides today, and at the bottom of the slides, I give credit to every author whose work I also use in my research. And you also don't have to just believe me. You can go and do your own research regarding these things. But let's read what this author says. Many people have heard of the Ten Commandments and recognize the importance of some of them, like the laws against murder and stealing. But other laws in the Bible are less well known or appreciated. Do the biblical laws apply today? Or did the Creator God establish them only to wipe them all out on the cross, only to promise their restoration during Christ's millennial rule? Or is there a larger meaning? to the whole subject of the law of God, one that bears witness to the very plan of God, which is always consistent and points toward the kingdom of God. So we must understand that God's plan is always consistent. His plan for mankind was from the beginning of time. That's why he gave us his word. And we must also understand that the Bible was not just given to the people of Israel or to us Christians today. The Bible is God's plan for mankind because all of mankind will stand before God's throne one day, whether they do believe it or not, whether they are Muslims, whether they are Hindus, whether they are Satanists, they will all stand before this God's throne one day. 
the God of heaven and earth, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He is the one and only true God. And if you wonder why I say so, I also have a YouTube video on a prophetic word in the Bible that proves why the Bible is the one true book that can give us eternal life that we learn from how to receive eternal life in our Lord Jesus Christ. And I also have a YouTube video on how do I give my life to Jesus Christ that you can also watch. Now Jesus himself said in Matthew 5 verse 17 to 19, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, Till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. I want you to take real close note of those words. Till all be fulfilled. Because we learn from the Bible that certain of these laws have already been fulfilled at Jesus' first coming. And some of them will still be fulfilled in the future. So this is one mistake that many people make, they say, okay, none of them have been fulfilled yet. And other people say, no, they've all been fulfilled already. No, no, no. It is a process of fulfillment. But they are all being fulfilled by our Lord Jesus Christ. And he proceeds to say, Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them the same, shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So we must really take note of these words of Jesus Christ. And Jesus also says in John 14 verse 15, Now who is Jesus? He is God himself. Because the Bible says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So who is the Word of God? Jesus Christ himself. And he said the following in John 14 verse 15, If ye love me, keep my commandments. So this is where we must decide where we find ourselves. Do we love the Lord Jesus? Because if we do, we are supposed to keep His commandments. But we can also learn which commandments He is specifically referring to. In John 14 verse 21, Jesus Himself is speaking again and He says, He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him. And will manifest myself to him. So when we keep the commandments of Jesus, we show that we love him. And if we love him, we will be loved by his father. And Jesus will also love us and he will manifest himself to us. Now the Old Testament law was to point out the people's sins and to show them it is impossible to please God by trying to obey all his laws. Nobody in the history of the Old Testament could live according to all the laws in the Old Testament. The only person ever who lived according to all the laws and who was obedient to all the laws was Jesus Christ himself. The beginning of the New Testament, the New Covenant, brought over 600 Old Testament ceremonial laws to an end, leaving the civil to guide man's conduct and moral laws, including the Ten Commandments, to identify what God considers to be a sin. So here we already see then there were three different types of laws. There were ceremonial laws, civil laws, and moral laws. There has been much debate over these laws, and how they apply. And I tell you now, with this little video, I'm just adding my little piece. So I am not the first person speaking about this. I will not be the last person speaking about this. And if Jesus does not come very soon, this debate will rage ever onwards. For the Christian, the civil and moral laws reveal the nature and will of God and how people are to live. And then this author refers to Galatians 3 verse 18 and 19 where Paul says, For if the inheritance comes by the law, it no longer comes by promise. But God gave it to Abraham by a promise. Why then the law? It was added because of transgressions until the offspring should come to whom the promise had been made. And it was put in place through angels by an intermediary. So the covenant with Abraham shows that faith is the only way to enter into heaven. God's promise to Abraham was through faith, while the old law focuses on actions. 
faith does not do away with the law. Please take note with this author writes here. Faith does not do away with the law. But the more we know God, the more obvious our sins become. Christians are to depend on their faith in Christ alone for salvation. In fact, Christ is the only way given for mankind to enter into heaven. 1 Timothy 2 verse 5. But we must also understand what Paul said about the law in Romans 7 verse 7, verse 12 and verse 14. He said, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. Wherefore, look at the report now. Wherefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just, and good. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. But the moment we also understand the three different types of laws, ceremonial, civil, and moral, we do understand that this spiritual law that Paul is referring to is not the ceremonial laws where people had to do sacrifices, etc. So this law that is good and holy and just, they are the moral laws of God teaching us how to live, but there were also some civil laws teaching us how to react and act towards others around us. In Romans 6 verse 14 to 16, Paul says, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. And people always read this verse to that period mark. And they say, do you see? We are not under the law, but under grace. So we don't have to listen to the law anymore. We don't have to worry about the law anymore. The law is not applicable to us. And by using that kind of uh, uh, wording, they chuck all the laws out of the equation, either ceremonial, civil, or moral. So this is not what the Bible teaches us. Look what Paul says. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? God forbid. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, ye servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness? So we can choose who we want to obey. Do we want to be servants of sin unto death? Or do we want to be servants of obedience? Obedience to what? To the laws of God and to righteousness. And the laws of God, if we are in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ and we are being led by the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will teach us which laws are still applicable to us and must we adhere to as such. Because we read in John 16 verse 13 and 14, How be it when He, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. And in 1 John 2 verse 26 and 27, it is written, These things have I written unto you concerning them that seduce you. But the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you. That refers to the Holy Spirit that lives within us who have received the Lord Jesus Christ. And ye need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teacheth you of all things, and is truth, and is no lie, and even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. So my brother and sister, we must understand one thing. The Holy Spirit of God was sent to us. When Jesus ascended to heaven, the Holy Spirit was poured out upon his disciples and also upon you and I who receive the Lord Jesus in our lives today. So the Holy Spirit comes and he teaches us into all truth. So I say to people, the only thing that happened now is God's laws, they did not disappear. They're still in this book, but they moved. They moved from the book into our hearts. They moved from the book into our minds. Because the Bible says, I will write them on your heart and in your minds. So this is what we must understand. The Holy Spirit, the same Holy Spirit that had the prophets of old in the Old Testament write down the laws and the things that were applicable to them in those times, it is the same Holy Spirit living within us today. So that same Holy Spirit is not divided against himself. And he will teach us in 
all truth. He will teach us all things. And that is why we must also always go back to him and say, Lord, I hear what this person says. While you're watching this video of mine, you can say to the Lord, Lord, I hear what Tian says, but I ask that your Holy Spirit will reveal the truth of what he's saying to me by your Holy Spirit and nothing else. So the Holy Spirit teaches us in all things and we must listen to the Holy Spirit and he will lead us according to the word of God and he will teach us which laws are still applicable to us today and must we listen to and adhere to and live according to. Now the ceremonial law, this type of law related to Israel's worship, Leviticus 1 verse 1 to 13. The laws pointed forward to Jesus Christ and were no longer necessary after Jesus' death and resurrection. Though we are no longer bound to them, the principles behind the ceremonial laws to worship and love God still apply. So remember, the ceremonial laws, they all referred to the sacrificial things that were happening in the tabernacle of Moses first and then in the temple of God. The sacrificial things regarding the washing of hands and the way that the sacrifices were brought and what the sacrifices meant and all those things. They were the ceremonial laws and they were all fulfilled in Jesus Christ, in his first coming, as we will see. Remember, Jesus said, not one jot or tittle will pass away from the law until they are all fulfilled. So the ceremonial laws were already fulfilled at Jesus' first coming. Civil law. This law dictated Israel's daily living, Deuteronomy 24, verse 10 and 11. But modern society and culture are so radically different that some of these guidelines cannot be followed specifically and the Holy Spirit will teach us which can and which cannot be. The principles behind the commands are to guide our conduct towards others around us. And then the moral law. The moral laws are direct commands of God. A good example is the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20 verse 1 to 17. The moral laws reveal the nature and will of God and still apply to us today. We do not obey this moral law as a way to obtain salvation, but to live in ways pleasing to God. And this is a very important point. We must understand, we do not try to follow the laws to obtain salvation by following the laws. You can never be saved by following any kind of law in the Bible. You can only be saved by, the, by receiving the Lord Jesus Christ in your life, by receiving that which he has done by faith in the finished work of our Lord Jesus Christ at the cross of Calvary. Not by, okay, I'm doing these laws and if I do these laws, then I think God will save me. No, no, no. You cannot be saved by doing the laws. But when you are saved and when you are in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, then His Holy Spirit leads you to the specific laws which are still applicable to us and which we must obey. Now, what is a law? How does man define the law? The New Oxford American Dictionary defines law as, number one, the system of rules that a particular country or community recognizes as regulating the actions of its members and may enforce by the imposition of penalties. Number two, a statement of fact deduced from observation to the effect that a particular natural or scientific phenomenon always occurs if certain conditions are present. Uh, for example, here the law of gravity, etc. Number three, the body of divine commandments as expressed in the Bible or other religious texts. This is now how man sees a law according to the New Oxford American Dictionary. Now, what is the law of God? How does God define the law of God? This question is of great importance, for it deals with our spiritual understanding. God's laws are the rules of the kingdom of God and His way of life. And my brother and sister, I also have a YouTube video on what is righteousness all about, where I explain in detail what God's way of doing things are like according to the word. So God's laws are the rules of the kingdom of God and his way of life. And they are divine and perfect in intent, equity and administration. Take note of that. The apostle Paul said God's law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good as well as spiritual, as I quoted in the Romans 7, verse 12 and 14 earlier. 
King David wrote, The law of the Lord is perfect. And again, I always refer people to the fact that when you read the word Lord in capital letters like that in the King James Version of the Bible, L-O-R-D, in the Hebrew, it is yod Hey vav Hey, because our Father's name in Hebrew is Yahweh. So the law of Yahweh is perfect, converting the soul. And he went on to describe the beauty and benefits of God's testimonies, statutes, commandments and judgments, various aspects of biblical law in Psalm 19 verse 7 to 11. But we also read in 1 Corinthians 2 verse 12 to 16 that Paul says the following. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God. Who is that spirit? That is the Holy Spirit that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. So if we have received the Spirit of God, we can know the things that are freely given to us of God. And then we will speak of these things, and we will compare spiritual things with spiritual but you see the natural man. The natural man is that person that wants to debate about everything, that wants to argue about everything, that wants to work everything out in his mind. He does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them. That word means he cannot understand them, because they are spiritually discerned. So as long as you try to compare apples with pears in your mind, you will not be able to understand what the Bible teaches also regarding the law. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. And who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Why can we say we have the mind of Christ? Because remember the Holy Spirit lives within us and he teaches us all truth. Biblical laws include a holy system of commandments, statutes and judgments that are meant to be observed by all countries and all people, for God created all people. My brother and sister, take note of what this author says here, because this is a very, very important fact. Whether people out there, Muslims, Hindus, Satanists, any other belief, want to believe it or not, they will all one day stand before the throne of the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. And that is why God gave his word and his laws, his statutes, his commandments for all of mankind. Because we will not stand before different gods' thrones one day. We will stand before one throne, the throne of our father Yahweh. And we must decide what we are going to do with his word. And the whole of mankind will be judged according to the word of God. God's laws define righteousness and sin. And here is the key. This author gives a very important key here. They are always for our benefit. See, if we live according to the word of God, under the leadership of the Holy Spirit, it will be to our benefit. Deuteronomy 6 verse 17 to 18, 7 verse 12 to 14, 10 verse 13. God's laws are not burdensome. Matthew 11 verse 30 and 1 John 5 verse 3. Despite what many religious leaders may tell you, because Matthew 11 verse 30 says, in so many words, Jesus is speaking. He says, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. But unfortunately, you see, the laws, the ceremonial laws were not that easy. And they could not do that. But if we start to follow Jesus, we know that his yoke is easy because his Holy Spirit now teaches us how to live according to the word of God. And 1 John 5 verse 3 says, for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. That word grievous means heavy or burdensome. So God's laws, his commandments are not heavy. They're not burdensome. They're not difficult. His yoke is easy. His burden is light. His commandments are not heavy or burdensome. But we have been taught that they are. So we don't want anything to do with it anymore. So we just say, no, 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 I'm not under the law. I'm under grace. I can do whatever I want. No, no, no. We know now 
that we are still being led by the Holy Spirit who teaches us all things also regarding which laws God wants us to live according to. So when God wrote the Ten Commandments in stone, He was writing the foundational framework for how mankind, not just Israel, should interact with God and with each other. Obviously, they were not the only laws, since many of God's laws predated the Old Covenant. The Old Covenant are the laws that God gave to Moses and the people of Israel at Mount Sinai. But many of these laws predate even that. While some laws were specific to the Old Covenant, others span across both the Old and New Covenants, and each one has a spiritual element. The Law of Marriage, for example. The law of marriage was given in the second chapter of the Bible. Marriage was defined by God as being between one man and one woman. Look at that, one man and one woman. Not man and man or woman and women. Long before the old covenant or today's social and political machinations, the plain truth is that God established this law for a purpose, providing the blessing of marriage and family by taking two equal but different people and joining them together. Husband and wife, Adam and Eve, man and woman, were given a joint purpose to strive together in hope and love for a reason. One that is lost today as society has twisted the gender roles and marriage into broken societal trappings in place of a God-given law that we read about in Matthew 19 verse 3 to 6. Genesis 2 verse 24 to 25 records, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother, and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. The Bible makes clear that God does not require everyone to marry, but those who do should follow this law for the stability of the family and society. This is a law that was before any covenant, and that spans across both old and new covenants. God is deeply concerned about families, for he is in the process of building one. And then another example, the law of clean and unclean meats. Many today regard the law of clean and unclean animals as an old covenant ceremonial law that was done away with when Christ was nailed to the cross. Modern Christianity teaches it as a Jewish tradition, antiquated and no longer necessary. Yet the first mention of this law was almost 1,000 years prior to its codification to the Israelites in Leviticus 11, also see Deuteronomy 14. The first mentions of this law are in Genesis 6 verse 19, 7 verse 2, 8 and 8 verse 20. To put it plainly, this law of clean and unclean meats long predates the old covenant. Noah was given clear instructions to set apart a different number of clean animals, seven, than unclean animals, too, just as Noah and his family were set apart by God from the wicked generation that he would destroy with a flood. But why would God do this? To begin with, God sets apart what is holy. He defines what is acceptable and righteous, not man. God then tells his people that they are to be holy. Deuteronomy 14 verse 2, 1 Peter 1 verse 16. Therefore, we must strictly avoid anything that would contaminate us, either physically or spiritually, 1 Corinthians 6 verse 15 to 20. This is a law that, like marriage, is still in effect today. And whether you believe it or not, I tell you, that law is applicable to us. And you can also watch my YouTube video that I have on why not eat pork and shellfish where I explain to you with also scientific and medical research why God said we should not eat these things and why it is still applicable to us to this very day if we are obedient to what God's word teaches us. What about ceremonial and civil laws? In addition to the old covenant made at Mount Sinai, Exodus 24 verse 3 to 8, 34 verse 28, God gave civil and ceremonial laws to the nation of Israel. For example, the sacrificial law was not part of the Old Covenant that was entered into at Sinai. Rather, it was added later, see Jeremiah 7 verse 22, Ezekiel 20 verse 21 to 25, and Galatians 3 verse 19. It was God's purpose to define the civil and sacrificial systems needed to govern a nation. Israel was to be set apart 
to be holy, Leviticus 20 verse 26, and blessed, Deuteronomy 28 verse 1 to 14, but only if they had a heart of obedience. Ceremonial law was a part of everyday life for the ancient Israelites, a way to teach them the spiritual principles needed to keep the law. Therefore, sacrifices and washings, among many other ceremonial acts, often centered around the tabernacle or the temple, as I explained earlier. And one of those ceremonial laws was the fact that they had to be circumcised physically, the people of Israel. So we read in John 7 verse 22, Jesus said, Moses therefore gave unto you circumcision, not because it is of Moses, but of the fathers. And ye on the Sabbath day circumcise a man. But that was in the Old Covenant. Since Jesus came, we do not have to be circumcised anymore. Because Romans 2 verse 28 and 29 teach us this new principle. For he is not a Jew which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men but of God. So we see now that the circumcision is not done in the flesh anymore. But if we receive the Lord Jesus, then we now know that sacrificial law was fulfilled in our Lord Jesus. So our hearts are circumcised the moment that we receive what Jesus has done for us by faith in his finished work on the cross. 1 Corinthians 7 verse 19 says, Circumcision is nothing, meaning the physical circumcision. It means nothing. And uncircumcision is nothing, meaning even if you're not circumcised, it also does not mean anything. But the keeping of the commandments of God. You see, people try to indicate that if you are circumcised, you are more holy. Or if you are circumcised, then you are part of the people of God. No. That does not mean anything to God anymore, but the keeping of the commandments of God. And Colossians 2 verse 10 and 11 says, And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power, in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. See, this is what we must understand. So the circumcision that we receive today is that we put off the body of sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, by receiving what Jesus has done for us. It is a circumcision made without hands. And then we read the warning that Paul gives in Galatians 5 verse 1 to 4 where he says, Stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you, that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised. Just take note here, he's referring to being circumcised for religious purposes, for faith purposes, not for medical purposes where a man has a problem and has to be circumcised medically. So, for I testify again to every man that is circumcised, that he is a debtor, to the whole law. So that means that person who has himself circumcised must now again keep the moral, the civil and ceremonial laws. Christ is become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. So now we cannot say, oh, you know what? Uh, I've had myself circumcised, circumcised, but I still want to be uh, saved by the grace of Jesus Christ. No, you have now fallen from grace. You cannot say, okay, now uh, I still want Jesus, but I want to be circumcised as well. You cannot have both. If you have yourself circumcised physically, Christ shall profit you nothing. Then you are bound to fall back to doing the whole law, the moral, the civil, and the ceremonial laws. And how will you be able to do that, my brother? But you thought you will become more holy because the group of people that you became part of said you will be part of the uh, children of God by having yourself circumcised because Israel had themselves circumcised. Yes, that was in the Old Covenant. 
in the new covenant, we only circumcise our hearts by receiving the Lord Jesus Christ and being saved by grace. So if you do that, you've got a problem that you have to repent before our Lord. So yes, what sacrifices do we still have to sacrifice today? Only spiritual sacrifices. We read it in 1 Peter 2 verse 5, where Peter says, Ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. What spiritual sacrifices are those? By becoming obedient to the word and out of our love for Jesus Christ, listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit, abstaining from the wrong things and doing the right things according to the word. Hebrews 13 verse 15 and 16 says, by him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. So this is one of the spiritual sacrifices that we can give today. The fact that we can give the sacrifice of praise, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name continually on a daily basis. This is one of those spiritual sacrifices that we can give. But to do good and to communicate, forget not. For with such sacrifices God is well pleased. Again, if I do good unto my neighbor, if I'm obedient to the word of God, then those are also part of my spiritual sacrifices. And God is well pleased with those kinds of sacrifices. And Romans 12 verse 1 says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. My brother and sister, do you see that? We, as part of our modern day spiritual sacrifices, must do what? We must present our bodies to God as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. So I must purify myself from all the things of the world. I must keep away from sin. I must stay away from sin. I must live according to the righteousness of God. I must learn from the word of God. What is God's way of doing things? Ask his Holy Spirit to lead me and his Holy Spirit will lead me in all truth. So if I want to do a certain thing and I say, Lord, can I do this or not? Then the Holy Spirit will say, but my son, that law is still applicable to you today. Don't do that. And so I'm being led by the Holy Spirit and I'm obedient to the word of God. And in that way, I am bringing spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable to God. And I give my body as a living sacrifice to God, which is holy and acceptable to God. And God is glorified thereby. Now let us quickly look at the festivals of God. And I also discuss this in more detail in my book on the rapture of the saints and the second coming of Jesus Christ. If you send me an email, I can send you a PDF version of that book of mine, or you can also find it as a free ebook on the internet, the rapture of the saints, true or false, uh, with my name connected to it. But let's see what this author wrote. The Sabbath, Passover and Feast of Unleavened Bread were revealed to Israel before they reached Mount Sinai. Then at Mount Sinai, all seven annual festivals of God were included during the giving of the Old Covenant. God also included sacrificial and ceremonial laws in the instructions for Israel on these holy days. Today, most Christian churches mistakenly relegate the biblical festivals to Jewish tradition. And in their place, most of Christianity has adopted pagan holidays like Valentine's Day, Halloween, Christmas, Easter, etc., etc. I discuss it all on different YouTube videos that I have available that you, you can watch. And we read in Colossians 2 verse 8 what God says about that. In so doing, the meanings of God's feasts are lost to them. Most think that the festivals were strictly tied to the Old Covenant. However, each feast actually represents or foreshadows part of the plan of God from the sacrifice of Jesus Christ to his return and beyond. The reality is that God's plan never changed, and that plan is still expressed through the festivals, which are still to be observed. And in my book on the rapture, I explain how we as New Testament believers in Jesus Christ still observe these festivals. 
without becoming Jewish or to, without falling back into the Jewish traditions regarding these festivals. In fact, without these days, we can't fully understand the spiritual plan that God has for all of mankind. Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, Feast of First Fruits, and Feast of Weeks were fulfilled at Jesus' first coming. They were spring feasts, symbolizing the beginning of the church age. The Feast of Trumpets, Day of Atonement, and Feast of Tabernacles will be fulfilled at His second coming. They are fall feasts, symbolizing the end of the church age. Although the seven feasts were celebrated ceremonially by the nation of Israel, to New Testament believers they all find their fulfillment in the two comings of our Lord Jesus, and are therefore not part of those ceremonial laws which were done away with completely. So the first four were fulfilled by our Lord Jesus Christ at His first coming, and I explained that in my book. The last three will also be fulfilled by our Lord Jesus Christ at His second coming, which I also explain in detail in that book of mine. Now what does all this mean? There are many laws in the Bible. Some were specific to a covenant, while others predate and extend through both the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. Many laws are still essential today, and they all are intended to give us a deeper understanding of what God expects and how He wants us to live. God gave the law of God out of love, so that it might go well with us. In fact, we must ask ourselves a very fundamental question at the end of this. Do we love God the Father and Jesus Christ? If we say yes, then do we keep the law of God? As Jesus Christ said, Do not think that I came to destroy the law of the prophets. I did not come to destroy but to fulfill, Matthew 5 verse 17, which I quoted earlier. And number two, if you love me, keep my commandments, John 14 verse 15, which I also quoted earlier. Now to give you some examples. All laws in which God warned Israel against idolatrous practices are still applicable to us New Testament believers today. They have not changed in God's eyes. Because remember, the Bible says Jesus Christ is the same, yesterday, today, and forever. And those things are still idolatrous practices. They have not changed in character. So God is still warning us against these things. For example, Leviticus 19 verse 4, Turn ye not unto idols, nor make to yourself molten gods. I am the Lord your God. I am Yahweh your God. So even to this very day, God does not want us to have any such idols in our homes. And I also have a number of YouTube videos on house cleaning available discussing this very important point. Leviticus 19 verse 27 and 28. Ye shall not round the corners of your heads, neither shalt thou mar the corners of thy beard. Ye shall not make any cuttings in your flesh for the dead, nor print any marks upon you. I am the Lord. Now, these refer to the idolatrous practices of the heathen nations that cut themselves for the dead, that made cuttings in their flesh for the dead, or that printed marks upon them. So many Christians say, but it's not applicable to us anymore. I can have tattoos, and they have tattoos of their dead brothers or dead sisters or dead mothers tattooed on them. They are having cuttings made in their flesh for the dead. What has changed? It is still an idolatrous practice. And I also have a whole YouTube video on tattoos alone where I discuss these two verses in much detail that you can watch if you want. Another example, Leviticus 19 verse 31. Regard not them that have familiar spirits, neither seek after wizards to be defiled by them. I am the Lord your God. What has changed? Wizards and those that have familiar spirits, witch doctors, witches, etc., you can be defiled by them. They are still the same in character. God is still the same God that says, don't do these things. And Deuteronomy 18 verse 10 to 12 said, There shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire, or that useth divination, or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer. A necromancer is a person speaking to the dead. God says, don't do these things. 
uh, and you know all people reading the Harry Potter books and all these books on witchcraft and enchantments and all the movies on witchcraft and magic and enchantments they are opposed to the word of God and God says in verse 12 for all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord so I ask the question when did God change his mind since when are these things not an abomination to him any longer because we listen to people we listen to the opinions of people and think that God will not mind. I can assure you, God still minds. He is still God. Idolatrous practices are still idolatrous practices and God is still God. And we will stand before his throne one day. And to use the argument that if something was written in the Old Testament, but not in the New Testament, then it is not applicable to us today because I hear even pastors telling their people in their churches you know what that verse for example the verse on um, tattoos it is not written in the new testament so then it's not applicable to us anymore we are not under the law we are under grace so get yourself some tattoos some christian tattoos even no i'm sorry that argument is totally untrue look at some of the verses which were written in the old testament and not in the new testament either so if that argument is valid can we do these things today then? For example, Leviticus 19 verse 29 that says, Do not prostitute thy daughter to cause her to be a whore, lest the land fall to whoredom and the land become full of wickedness. That verse is also not written in the New Testament. So if the argument is valid, that if something is not written in the New Testament, it is not applicable to us anymore, then today we can also prostitute our daughters. Is it not? No. If you say no, why? Because you just said, Verse 28 that says you cannot have a tattoo is not applicable to us. So why is verse 29 applicable to us then? Deuteronomy 27 verse 21. Cursed be he that lieth with any manner of beast, and all the people shall say, Amen. Deuteronomy 27 verse 22. Cursed be he that lieth with his sister, the daughter of his father, or the daughter of his mother, and all the people shall say, Amen. So again, if the argument is valid, that if something is not written in the New Testament, it is not applicable to us anymore, and then we can partake in that. That means, can we now have sex with animals or with our sisters? No, of course not. Now, why is it not written in the New Testament? Because God does not have to repeat himself twice about everything. He already spoke in the Old Testament. You see, these are part of the moral laws, of the way that God wants us to live in obedience to his word. He does not want us to prostitute our daughters. He does not want us to have sexual relationship with animals or with our sisters. Why? Because they were idolatrous practices again. The heathen nations did these things. And God said, you will not be like the heathen nations. So this is the way he teaches us. For we read in Malachi 3 verse 6, For I am the Lord. I am Yahweh. I change not. Hebrews 13 verse 8, Jesus Christ the same yesterday and today and forever. So the same God that said, you shall not prostitute your daughter, you shall not sleep with an animal, you shall not have sex with your sister in the Old Testament, is still the same God to this very day. He has not changed his mind. The point is that when I am in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, I want to be obedient to him and his laws. Why? Because I love him. And not because I'm afraid he will kill me with a lightning bolt if I am not obedient to him. And because I love him, I keep his commandments as the Holy Spirit leads me to on a daily basis. Because we read in Romans 8 verse 14, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. So if the Holy Spirit leads me in all truth, the Holy Spirit will teach me which of these laws are still applicable to us and which are not? How does God want me to live? How does God want me to act or react towards others around me? And I can read it in the word of God and the Holy Spirit will reveal it to me. And then I become obedient to those laws, not because I'm afraid of uh, that I will be punished if I don't do the laws, but because I love him. Because I love him, I keep his commandments. And remember, God is not divided against himself. In Matthew 12 verse 25, Jesus said, Jesus knew their thoughts and he said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. And every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. So 
will God's Holy Spirit teach you in the new covenant to be disobedient to things that he said was an abomination to him in the old covenant? No, he won't because he has never changed and is not divided against himself. So if something was wrong morally or even civilly in the Old Testament, it is still wrong morally to this very day. And God still wants us to live in certain ways according to his rules. But yet there are people telling other people, don't worry about this. You are not under the law anymore. You are under grace. You can do whatever you want, etc., etc. No, no, no. There is a warning about these people in, in 2 Corinthians 11 verse 13 to 15, where Paul writes, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. So, if they say to people, you can be disobedient to the law that says, don't get any tattoos. Will God say you can be disobedient to his own law that says, don't get tattoos because it's an idolatrous practice? No, God will not. So, who is telling people that? An angel? Uh, which angel? A true angel or one coming as an angel of light where the ministers transform themselves as ministers of righteousness but they are teaching people the things of darkness. So let's look at this verse again that Jesus says in Matthew 5 verse 17 to 19. Think not that I am come to destroy the law of the prophets. I am not come to destroy but to fulfill. And now I've shown you today how some of the laws were already fulfilled and are in the process of fulfillment and how many of them will still be fulfilled in the millennial reign of Jesus and the things coming. For verily I say unto you till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. So yes, certain laws were fulfilled in the past. And some will be fulfilled in the future when Jesus comes. But look at the red part now. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them. In other words, the laws of God, the moral laws, the laws that teach us how to live, to be obedient to God, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So my brother and sister, you have a decision today. I've just given you a short kind of introduction. And as I say, I'm not the first person speaking about this. You've seen the research that I used and you can go and do your own research regarding the laws of God. And you will see many people debate about this. I just found that the moment that I fell in love with our Lord Jesus Christ, I wanted to become obedient to his word and I started to read his word and then the Holy Spirit started showing me that some of these laws were already fulfilled at Jesus' first coming and other laws he showed me and he said, Tian, you are still not doing this one. Tian, become obedient to this one. Tian, stop doing that. You're not supposed to do that. And when I started to become obedient to the voice of the Holy Spirit in me, leading me in the truth of the word, I started enjoying my relationship with Jesus Christ because the Holy Spirit leads me according to the law of love. Because I love my Jesus. I want to be obedient to his word. And then I listen to his Holy Spirit and the voice of the Holy Spirit leads me and he teaches me in all truth. But remember, my brother and sister, we do not serve a dead God. Jesus said in Revelation 1 verse 17 and 18, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. And all honor and glory goes to Jesus Christ of Nazareth. All honor and glory to this God that gave himself for us, who died on a cross for us, so that we can have eternal life in him. If we receive him, by grace we are saved. If we receive that which he has done for us, by faith in the finished work at the cross of Calvary. And if you have not yet received the Lord Jesus Christ, Please pray this prayer that we will show you now and receive the Lord Jesus in your life because eternity is waiting. The coming of our Lord Jesus is very close at hand and we call out Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. So let us pray together. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you, Lord. Thank you that you've given us your laws so that we can live according to your way and that it is applicable to all of mankind. 
and that all of mankind will stand before your throne one day. And we thank you that you are God. We thank you that you loved us first. And therefore, Father, we can say we love you, Father. We love you with the love that you've given us out of your own heart. And thank you that that love leads us to live according to the law of love and to be obedient to everything that you have given us. And we glorify your name, Lord. We thank you that you teach us. We thank you that you lead us. And we know that your Holy Spirit will also teach the people listening to this message to go to you and ask you which laws they still need to apply in their own lives. Which are they still not doing yet? And which must they still do? And Lord, I know you will lead them as you've been leading me for the past number of years. And I thank you for your glory. I thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy in the name of Jesus Christ. And Lord Jesus, yes, we keep on crying out. Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. Amen.